I still use glute squats and hill elevated squats and balance squats and stuff like that in all of my groups from time to time. I, I think the squat is still a great exercise. Um, I don't really squat much anymore because in powerlifting, after squatting pretty much you know every single week for 10 years, I just I just don't want to squat anymore. Um, and I've never, ever regretted not squatting anymore. So the squat is still a great exercise though. Uh, the barbell squat, I would prefer people to use a safety bar squat. So if you were talking about replacing those big three, um, the squat could stay in there, but I would just replace it with the safety bar. Number one, you get a better shoulder position. A lot of people can't get their hands behind them. Uh, they don't have the shoulder mobility. People say like, we'll give a shoulder, better shoulder mobility. Okay. Or we could just use the safety bar and then we don't have to worry about shoulder mobility. And it's actually anatomically a better um, position to be in. Uh, it's a more natural position. Today's episode is with repeat guest, Paul Carter. Paul is a successful bodybuilder, powerlifter, fitness writer, and the founder of Lift Run Bang. Paul has spent almost 30 years of his life devoted to developing training and nutritional strategies that he has used to coach thousands of clients. So in this episode, we're diving into lots of topics related to training and nutrition that include how to know if you're making an exercise more or less effective, Paul's opinion on warm-ups and activation exercises, why the traditional squat, deadlift, and bench press movements may be overrated for hypertrophy, top reasons diets fail, and why it's virtually impossible to store protein as body fat. So I had a blast reconnecting with Paul again on the show, and I know you're going to take a ton of great info from this, web, from this episode. So let's get into it with Paul Carter. All right, welcome back to Metflex and Chill. This is Rachel Gregory, your host, and I'm here with Paul Carter, repeat guest. What's up, Paul? How are you? I am good. I'm good. I'm glad to be back. Yeah, I'm glad to have you back. Um, if anybody's listening or watching and they didn't see the first episode we recorded together, that was episode 122. Um, it was the uh, how to optimize hypertrophy training. And if you haven't listened to that one yet, definitely go back and listen to that one after you listen to this one um, or watch this one. That was a really, really great episode. Lots of feedback on that one. We were talking about that off air. Um, so lots of really good nuggets of, of info in there with both training and nutrition. Um, so today I want to kind of do a follow up and talk about a few other of the million questions that I have for you. Um, okay. So we'll probably get to like three of them, which is fine. Um but yeah, do you want to just give anybody who maybe hasn't, you know, listened to the previous episode or just doesn't know who you are, you want to give them a little background on who you are, what you do, um, why you're the king of hypertrophy training? <laughs> um, I don't think I have that that title, um, <laughs> and I don't I don't want it because that would be a <laughs> hefty crown to wear. Um, I I try to do that my best with like that I can with that particular topic. There's lots of people in the uh, in the world of ev like true evidence based uh, hypertrophy stuff that I consider to be way smarter than me, and I'm fortunate enough to work or learn from them as well. So um, I would not call myself the king. <laughs> maybe um maybe like a prince in waiting or something. I don't know, but <laughs> definitely not the king. Um, my background goes through like more than like three decades of training now. I uh, competed in power, competitive powerlifting for 10 years. I wasn't very good at that. And, um, but I retired from that uh, because I didn't want to be, um, you know, like almost 300 pounds anymore and can like consistently obsessed with, uh, with load on the bar. And I retired from that. Uh, when I, once I retired from that, I, I went back to my true love of training, and that is bodybuilding-based hypertrophy training. Um, and my big, probably my biggest regret is that I ever even got away from it and did powerlifting. People always ask me about it all the time. It's because um, I just didn't come away from doing powerlifting for 10 years, like with a complete, like a positive experience where my training, my body, my training, uh, my personal educational growth, all that stuff um, has been so much more dramatic over the last few years that I retired from, from powerlifting and got back to doing what I really love. So that was probably kind of a wasted time in my life in terms of lifting. Not, maybe not wasted, but I, I definitely uh, learned I did not want to be doing that. So uh, I've also written, I think, for just about every major publication uh, that has to do with fitness. Uh, I was a um, uh, one of the main writers for Key Nation for I don't know how many years for bodybuilding.com, uh, Muscle and Strength. I've written for Muscle and Fitness. I've written for Flex Magazine, uh, Men's Fitness. I, I can go through the long list. I've written seven books. Um, and now I currently run my own online um, coaching application. 
um, from Train Heroic, where I have three groups in there that I run uh, that I am incredibly excited about. Keeps me motivated all the time. And I, I use that word loosely because I think motivation has to do with action. I think the root core of motivation is action. But um, I really love what I do. And I feel very blessed and fortunate to wake up every day and get to do what I truly love. And a lot, a lot of people don't get to do that. So mm -hmm. that's the 30,000 foot view. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And I am fortunate enough to say the same thing as, as you wake up every day, love what I do so much. Um, and it's, it is definitely a blessing. So definitely agree with that. Um, so I want to dive into, um, I know we're talking off air how like we have, I have a lot of questions, so I'm just going to dive right into it. Um, yep. so I want to start off talking about a few training things and then, um, hopefully have time to get into a few nutrition, um, nutrition topics, but the first topic that I want to discuss, because I see this a lot um, from just either clients that I'm working with or, you know, people posting on social media or whatever it is, um, kind of the idea of trying to make exercises more effective by adding certain things, whether it's bands or, um, you know, other types of modalities to certain exercises, thinking that it's making it better, right? Right. Um, but in actuality, it might actually be making it more, I mean, sorry, less effective. So maybe we can kind of just dive into like why that might be the case and what you see most commonly kind of misused when it comes to that type of thing. We see, um, people generally adding movements to, or motions to other motions on social media. Um, wow. There's so many places that I could go with this. Probably the most popular one that I do see is uh, a lot of ladies putting the bands around the knees um, in order to what they say is getting more glute activation. Um, there's a lot to unpack really in terms of that kind of stuff. Number one, um, a lot of times it's occurring on stuff like a hip thrust or a glute bridge or those kind of things. Now, there is some truth to the fact that a certain amount of external rotation and abduction will allow us to activate more of the glutes. Um, but that is due to the fact that as you're going into hip extension, that the glutes pull on the femur. And so there's some external rotation that the glutes want to do as they shorten to pull on that femur into external rotation and to and do some abduction. So having some of that occur can help in terms of getting uh, the hips um, into more terminal extension and shortening the glutes. Now, the problem is, is that, and you can test this on yourself, if you stand up and you take a leg and you kick your leg behind you, and then you go into abduction, what happens is you lose range in that hip extension. So if you're doing a hip thrust or a glute bridge and you're going into hip extension and you add excessive abduction, like we see women do, quite often with the bands. And I say women and somebody out there be like, oh my gosh, you're so sexy. I generally just see, it's just an observation. I generally do just see women doing this. I don't, I have seen guys doing it. Um, so that we can just say anyone doing it. Uh, so that way nobody, you know, gets their, their feathers ruffled. But um, <laughs> anyone doing it generally is, is thinking, and I've even heard, you know, people that I, you know, I work with and stuff like this is more glutes. It's not more glutes. Um, as you go into hip flexion, there is, the joint axis changes for the muscles that are around the hip, for example, like the, the glute max uh, and the piriformis and those muscles right at the hip. So as you go into hip flexion, joint, ax, joint axis changes for those muscles. And then what has the most direct line of pull to do stuff like abduction will change during different degrees of hip flexion and hip extension as well. So what is best is when you're doing something like a thrust or a bridge, well, what we should just be focusing on the main motion that we're trying to do there, which is hip extension, and then allow a certain degree of abduction or a certain degree of external rotation to occur naturally as the body wants to do. So what a lot of these people do is they add a motion to it because they'll say, oh, well, the glutes do abduction on the glute uh, or the glute medius does abduction. This is true but it needs context when you start saying that. So you just can't slather on uh, a band around, you know, your knees and start doing abduction and every exercise, all of a sudden it's more glutes. Lots of times that's going to make it a less effective exercise. 
it, this isn't just glutes. I see people, um, I made a post a while back about how people get really bendy when they do a lat pull down that's happening in the sagittal plane. So on the front of the body, you're pulling down, people get really bendy. Well, the lats have a small component to them where they can do lateral flexion. So they can basically flex the spine laterally, okay? But it's only really minor. It's not, it's not a huge component. And then they'll say stuff like, I feel that more in my lats when I'm doing that. What they're really feeling is their external obliques contracting when they do that. Because think about it, when you do, you grab a dumbbell on one hand, do that side bend thing, you're, mm -hmm. you do that to train your external obliques. Well, that's essentially what's doing that motion. But even more so, what's happening there is you're not making some more synergistic lat training approach. You're actually making it less synergistic because as the spine goes this way and you're pulling this way, you actually take the origin further away from the insertion. So we we get a less shortened lat as we're doing that. So the best thing is to do is focus on the primary motion that you're going to be training, adding other component motions, even if that muscle has that particular component function in it probably needs context. For example, people will often say stuff like the pet, the pecs and the lats are internal rotators, but that all depends on the position of the humerus and they don't do any type of internal rotation to end ranges where they're actually really internally rotating uh, the humerus and stuff like that. So just that stuff needs context. What you really need to focus on is there, is there a primary motion that you're wanting to take those bones joints through and for what's going to be doing the prime moving in terms of that motion and then just focus on that motion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And other question came up uh, just as you were talking about like glute activation. Um, and I think we did talk a little bit about this last time, but just kind of want to hit on it. Cause I know this is something that um, with, you know, activation exercises and warm up movements and things like that. Can you give us a little bit of your uh, like your opinion on that um, and kind of how that maybe has evolved over the years. Uh, that one also, you know, is basically based in a lot of um, what I would call like just poor approaches to training. So like we don't, have you ever heard of deltoid activation like stuff? People need to do activation exercises for the deltoids or triceps or whatever. You don't hear that stuff. And somehow yeah. people will say the glutes are completely distant muscles. No, they're not. If you if you, you weren't able to activate your glutes, then when you go to sit down and stand up and do stuff like that, you just fall over. They still do work, just like other muscles do work. Um, the myth was created a long time ago. People have, uh, you know, sleepy glutes and they can't fire their glutes. But if you get into a proper, um, if you get into a proper, basically, position for something like a glute bridge, well, the hamstrings are put into a state of active insufficiency. So they can't even um, generate much force in that movement. And then the adductors don't do much hip extension except unless you're in deep hip flexion. So the only muscles that can really do the hip extension are the glutes. So one of the things I've always said is a good glute exercise is a good activation exercise. And so there's not really much of a need to go and do a bunch of quote unquote activation exercises when you can just use good glute movements and they'll take care of that for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. What about like when it comes to shoulder movements and stuff I see, and I used to do this a lot too, where we see, you know, doing like the, like before you do shoulder day, you're like doing right. all this stuff with your arms back and forth. Like we used to do that when I was in athletic training, like for prehab and rehab and stuff with all the bands and stuff. Is there any, uh, any validity to that? I don't think that that when you're somebody who's going to do some external rotation, um, you know, maybe the Ted shoulder problems or whatever, maybe. Um, they need to do it because, you know, somebody like, and I don't work with stuff like pictures or, uh, you know, like baseball pictures or uh, pitcher pitchers, um, or fo like football players, like quarterbacks or whatever that do a lot of throwing motions. Um, and I do know that there's, uh, from some of the guys I know that work with those type of athletes, there's a little bit more of an emphasis on rotator cuff type strengthening, but for the most part, um, those are going to get adequate stimulus. Uh, they're small muscles. You don't, um, that I would consider the rotator cuff muscle to be somewhat not delicate, but they're there to basically hug the humerus into the GH joint and to create stability for it. So it, if you want to do some rotator cuff stuff, that's cool. I would always do it at the end of the training session and not before. Mm -hmm. um, if you're doing it to strengthen them, you didn't, the approach there would need to be very similar. You need to actually do exercise to strengthen the rotator cuff, but I wouldn't do them to start. Why would you fatigue the muscles that are smaller and more delicate 
and then go do a bunch of big movements where they have to provide stability for that joint. Um, and that that has never made much sense to me. But for the most part, um, I think unless you have like I have sub like subluxation in my left shoulder, so it's permanently separated. And no matter what I do for it, it just hurts sometimes. There's nothing I could ever do for it. Um, but people who have legitimate um, like prior like slap tears or their cuff tears or whatever, if they want to do some of that kind of work, I would just suggest throwing it at the end of the workout. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. The way that you put that in terms of like it doesn't make sense to fatigue the smaller muscles when you're going to go try to work the bigger ones. And those are the stable, like stabilizing. Yeah, I wouldn't, yeah, I would never take that approach. Yeah. <laughs> it makes a lot of sense when you say it out loud. Okay. <laughs> um, cool. Awesome. Um, all right. So I want to get into, um, this is something that I've seen you post a little bit about, and I want to kind of talk about it because I've changed my view on this over the years as well, especially moving from more CrossFit, uh, type performance type training over to more bodybuilding type training. Um, and just kind of getting, you know, more involved in that and trying to optimize as much as possible. So when it comes to like the, the top three overrated hypertrophy exercises that you talk about, um, can you just give us a little background on like, why, like, what are the top three? Obviously you can talk about those and then kind of what would be, I mean, there's so many other options for each of them, but like, what would be your top swap um for maybe those three movements so Sorry. my top three overrated was i always make a joke about it being squat bitch and deadlift and the reason why that i say that is because there's li clear limitations that come with those lists when it comes to hypertrophy and there's clear limitations when it comes to hypertrophy and barbells and i've like written a whole article out of it i wrote an article article for uh for chess magazine about the limitation um, of barbells, everything from the fact that we lock joints in particular places and we aren't able to take advantage of particular motions that the muscles actually move through. Um, and then the other thing is uh, the fact that we have very limited resistance, pro resistance profile, so we don't get to stress um, the muscles across what I would consider larger ranges of motion. We've got drop-offs in uh, peak forces whenever the joints get stacked, for example, at the top of the bench press or at the top of the squat or at the top of the deadlift. There's, so you're gonna be able to stress uh, the muscles in very specific ranges with a barbell, um, but it has a multitude of limitations as far as motions go. For example, the pecs use arcing motions. Um, a squat's not, uh, it's a, the barbell squat is still a good lift. Uh, deadlift, I have never, and don't consider a great lift for hypertrophy. You can make it a better lift for hypertrophy with, uh, with some adjustments made to it. But those three lifts, the reason why I say they're overrated is not because they're, they're just flat out crappy. They're, I can consider them to be poor choices when there's better options, but I call them overrated because most people run around saying those are like the best lifts that you could be doing to grow. And I just, that's just not true. And then people will add on stuff like, well, don't you think beginners should be doing them to build a base? I'm like, beginners can use anything to build a base. If you want to slap a beginner on, you know, leg presses and RDLs and dumbbell bench pressing, why couldn't they do that? There's no reason why mm -hmm. they couldn't do those. And in my opinion, those would potentially be, for some people, better moves to select, there, especially like the RDL and the uh, like a dumbbell bench press or an inclined dumbbell press or cable motions or stuff like that, where we're actually taking... Um, the pecs, for example, through a longer range of motion, we're actually loading it in the more length and mid and short position better. Um, an RDL is a better glute exercise than a traditional deadlift, in my opinion. It doesn't come with the same amount of systemic fatigue. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, something like a hack squat or a leg press where you have higher degrees of stability. and You can actually just get a beginner on there. They don't have to focus on, you know, all the intricacies that comes with learning like a squat pattern. So squat patterns can be hard to learn for some people. You can slap somebody in a leg press or a hack squat and let them just go to town from day one. Mm -hmm. So for when it comes to hypertrophy training, uh, the, the, to me, the big three squat, bench, and deadlift are pretty poor selections for multiple reasons. It doesn't mean that, that you can't build muscle. I never said any, you know, you're going to use those and you end up, you know, with like glute, you know, pec and, and, you know, quad cancer. I never, like people, they, they take massive liberties with most of the things that I write. I'm like, I did, I have to, I try to do a better job of clarifying that, clarifying that now, but mm -hmm. I would just wouldn't use those because of the massive amount of limitations that they come with. And there's simply just a multitude of better options that you could be using in your high hypertrophy training. They give a, a much higher degree of stimulus to fatigue ratio. Um, and they just do a better job of loading muscle 
uh, at different lengths and taking uh, the bones and joints through better motions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. That makes sense. I would say like one of the things that I've come across as I'm, you know, getting more experienced in, in all of this and nerding out on all things, you know, biomechanics and, and training. Um, like when I'm programming for my clients, I have a lot that are, you know, still training from home. So they have limited equipment. Right. And so they're, um, you know, whether it's just access to a barbell and a rack and like, how do we optimize, like you said, the squat, it's not a bad exercise and you can definitely tweak lots of things to help, you know, get. Yeah. I still, I still use glute squats and Hill elevated squats and balance mm -hmm. squats and stuff like that in all of my groups from time to time. I, I think the squat is still a great exercise. Um, I don't really squat much anymore because in powerlifting, after squatting pretty much you know every single week for ten years, I just I just don't want to squat anymore, um, yeah. and I've never ever regretted not squatting anymore. So the squat is still a great exercise, though uh, the barbell squat. I would prefer people to use a safety bar squat. So if you were talking about replacing those big three, um, the squat could stay in there, but I would just replace it with the safety bar. Number one, you get a better shoulder position. A lot of people can't get their hands behind them. Uh, they don't have the shoulder mobility. People say like, we'll give a shoulder, better shoulder mobility. Okay. Or we could just use the safety bar and then we don't have to worry about shoulder mobility. And it's actually anatomically a better um, position to be in. Uh, it's a more natural position. To be in. And then the distribution of the load across the back is better. So we actually have a little bit better stability there too. So I prefer something like a safety bar squat, uh, a deadlift you can swap out. Most people think a deadlift, a lot of people think a deadlift is a back exercise, but there's nothing that's actually attached to the scapula that does hip extension. So um, an RDL would be a better swap there. And like I said, for stuff that's pressing, any type of dumbbell, uh, dumbbell or cable press, in my opinion, would probably be a better option than bench pressing for sure. Mm -hmm. What about overhead press with a barbell? Um, the overhead press with a barbell, honestly, is just training for the most part, uh, that movement pattern. Yes, of course, the deltoids are getting work, um, but all depending on structure, uh, you take somebody that's got short little stubby arms and has a very strong upper back. And there's a lot of upwards rotation that happens in elevation at the scapula. So it can be a, a really good upper back movement for some people. Uh, like I said, if they have very strong upper back and have short arms, they're training that movement pattern so from actually stressing the delts better um you can use a proper what i call an anterior dumbbell press where you can get that anterior deltoid a little bit better lengthened and then you can line up um that humerus better with that anterior deltoid so that way the motion again pecs the the delts just like the pecs tend to use arcing motions so again once again the, the barbell is going to lock you into kind of a a more straight up and down pattern rather than getting that arcing motion and when i say arcing it's both coming out to the side and in whereas when we're the bar we're pressing kind of straight like this so it's not that again that the, a barbell overhead press couldn't build big shoulders it certainly can there's lots of people that have used that but i'm saying from a what's going to offer you a better motion to go through to take that interior delt through something like a dumbbell press done properly will do that mm -hmm. yeah for sure and i think also something to think about too is like within your training, obviously thinking about the goal, but then also thinking about, you know, what is going to be more optimal for your jo joints as you're aging as well, because that's something that like, we're like, oh, it doesn't hurt now. But then in 10 years from now, you're like, crap, I wish that I um, didn't do that. Or I and wish that, that is I, actually, yeah. that's actually a really, really good point that often gets lost in these discussions is that um, just because, you know, people say like, well, these these movements, one of the reasons why what I think is a good hypertrophy movement is a movement that I can't perform over 10, 15, 20 years um, and not one I, that I've been doing. Well, I've been doing this movement for you know 10 years and now I have this shoulder pain or this knee pain or whatever because we've consistently created these reps uh, where we put the joints in positions that aren't really that friendly and it creates a lot of torque uh, on the soft and connective tissue in there and over time that's what ends up wearing us down. So people, uh, I was told this, the same thing back when I was um, in my twenties and it was, uh, you know, skull crushers, you can do start doing skull crushers, you know, and when you're in your teenage years and your twenties, they probably won't bother your elbows that much, but after repetitive use over those years um, with that, that, that some tremendous amount of torque that ha happens at the elbow joint uh, that it has to overcome, it tends to beat every, everybody up over time. So there's mm -hmm. better options to use there um, that don't create as much havoc on the soft and connective tissue 
that we can still use. We can add load to over time that we can progressively overload and do all those things. So to me, the other part that often gets overlooked in good hypertrophy movements is can I do this movement consistently for the next 10 or 15 years without incurring some type of overuse pain? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you completely hit on exactly what you're trying to get at. So, um, and like you said, it's definitely overlooked and it's something that we don't think about because it's like, oh, it doesn't hurt now. So why does it matter? But you know, right. a few years from now, you might be not, not so happy with yourself. Um, <laughs> if it's two years, it was really bad, but yeah, um, that's great. <laughs> Same thing for like uh, upright rows, you know, it's like, um, a lot of people can do upright rows for a long time, but eventually what will happen if you're doing that really close grip, um, and you know, you're pulling up, um, like in an upright row like that right there is there's a lot of impingement that's going on where the, uh, the head of the humor is just consistently rubbing up against those rotator cuff muscles. And when you lose that acromion space and that happens over time, yeah, you're going to end up with some shoulder pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So I think the main takeaway is just like, even if you see someone doing an exercise on social media or whatever, and you're like, oh, that looks really good. Social is honestly the worst now, man. It's, it's, yeah. I get sent videos <laughs> every day. I don't even respond to it, but I get sent videos every day. I think the, the probably the biggest problem that we face now with social media in terms of fitness is that there's people with massive accounts that have amazing physiques that do really dumb exercises every day that they post because a huge part of the, those people having big accounts is that they look really good and then so people think automatically if they look really good that they must be doing you know really good stuff there's somehow they've created that lot that that fallacy there that well if somebody has a really great physique and they have to be doing all the right stuff and they have to know what they're doing um, those those things are not always connected so people end up growing a lot of times those large accounts because they look really good and because they consistently are just trying to create, you know, new exercises for, for the purpose of looking trendy at looking, being novel for the purpose of engagement and likes. But when you ask them why they're doing it in a certain way, they don't really know. They'll just say, I feel this more. And you really can't go off feeling. You have to understand what, mm -hmm. what that, why you're getting that particular feeling or sensation. Um, or they'll say that, so-and-so is based, I've heard this one before, so-and-so is science-based and they said do this and that person <laughs> will, won't know what the hell they're talking about either. So <laughs> social is yeah, pretty bad. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we definitely, we dove into uh, sensation versus uh, stimulation a lot in the last episode. So if anybody is like, I have no idea what you're talking about, definitely go back to episode 122. I think we talked about that for a really long time. So yeah, um, and that's, that's actually, that has been a continued source of education for me because there's even a lot more there. Um, I've been fortunate. The, the guy that I look up to the most in regards to muscle physiology and stuff like that is a guy by the name of Chris Beardsley. And I talk to Chris every week now, and we're starting to do some work together. And, um, he talks a lot about sensation of innervation theory, uh, which is the fact that you can actually feel motor unit recruitment in a muscle. But this this is a lot of times the sensation that you're feeling in a muscle. There's a multitude of reasons we can have high degrees of sensation when a contraction is occurring, um, but generally speaking, it's because we're feeling the degree of motor unit recruitment that is occurring. But this can be happening for a multitude of reasons. It has nothing to do with tension. But a lot of people base way too much of what they consider mind to muscle connection on that high degree of feeling or sensation in a muscle. When so many things could be happening, you could be actually circumventing the proper uh, neuromechanical matching that happens where a muscle has a the pro appropriate internal leverage to be the prime mover in a load, but because we're trying, we're trying to actually make another muscle do the movement, um, we actually interfere with the proper muscle that wants to do uh, the prime moving in that load, and we can get a high degree of sensation, but it's not because there's more mechanical tension going on. It's because we're simply recruiting more motor units for that particular muscle, and again, this doesn't mean you're going to mechanically load it effectively. Some people have trouble detaching for that particular idea. So there's a lot of reasons why people can get a high degree of sensation in a muscle. The joint can be in a compromised position. Um, it can be less stable. One of the ones I consistently bring up is like leg curls. When people do plantar flexion and leg curls and they point their toes in a leg curl, they'll say, oh, my hamstrings, they like really get fired up in that. I'm like, right, because you're working off a less stable knee. So there's feedback. There's afferent feedback from the hamstrings to the nervous system and you feel that, you feel that there's more motor unit recruitment, but the first thing you're gonna notice is there's going to be a drop-off in loading. 
So you can use, you can't use anywhere near as much load because you have a less stable joint. So you have a higher degree of sensation that you're going to feel in the hamstring, which is part of innervation uh, theory, because you're going to feel more motor unit recruitment. And but you're going to work, we are working off the less stable joint. And anytime we're working off a less stable joint, we're going to get less output from that particular muscle that we're trying to work. Mm -hmm. Would you say like, because I think we talked about the frog pump last time. Are there any other movements? Like, I think we also talk about elevating your, uh, your toes when you're doing an RDL and how that is. Yeah. Elevating toes, to, yeah. You know. yeah. I mean, generally it comes back to anytime you're getting a high degree of sensation in a muscle, it doesn't always mean that it's bad, but you have to understand there, there does come a point where you have to understand, is it bad or is it not bad? Um, but one that comes up, the other one comes up, I just posted is those straight flyer uh, glute raises. You get that uh, sensation of innervation in your hamstrings there because the hamstrings are short at the knee and the hip. And a lot of people feel, um, I, this one, I get asked this one a lot, they will feel a lot of hamstrings and stuff like glute bridges. It's the same experience. So just because you're feeling something that in those particular cases, that doesn't mean the joint's in a bad position. But a lot of people, when they do stuff like try to get really crampy, like bicep contractions and stuff, and they're going into like tons of like shoulder flexion, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, that is not, that's a, a case where it's like, okay, we're not actually working off the right position that the shoulder wants to be in uh, so that the biceps can create output effectively. Mm -hmm. So we get different sensations based on different reasons. Um, and a lot of people just consistently just base if uh, exercise is working off of those particular sensations, not knowing necessarily why they're getting. Yeah, for sure. So this actually kind of brings me into one of, we have one listener question that kind of uh, piggybacks off of this topic. So I want to ask you this now, if that's okay. Um, and then okay. maybe if we have a few more minutes, we can dive into a few uh, nutrition related uh, questions, but um, it's a little bit of a, a long question. So I'll just start reading it. Um, so this, um, female asked in my own training, I struggle with gauging intensity and knowing when I have effectively failed. I come from a history of sweat drenched, burn chasing over exercising. I've come a long way in not chasing the burn, but I still wonder if I'm actually getting close enough to failure and putting in enough intensity. I find myself sneaking in a lot of drop sets or partials on my last set because I want to feel it more, which I know is dumb. Um, anything that Paul can say on how he uses one hard set or, and not training to get tired um, and implementing failure effectively would be great. Yeah. And okay. So that's another one that, that does come up really often with what I consider like women, women um, have in, in my experience, and I think there's actually some medical evidence behind this, higher tolerances for pain. I mean, you guys got to have, you got to yeah. birth, you know? So yeah. it tends to like, I, and you know, men tend to be, what is it? The whole thing about men being big babies when they're sick. I actually never had that. I didn't know that was a thing until like years ago. And I was like, because I've, I've never had that. Um, so I, I didn't understand that was a thing, but I guess it's like a real thing for men and men actually do experience stuff like colds and the flu, like more severely than women do. So you guys have higher degrees of pain tolerances. And a lot of times what happens with women in training is that they equate high degrees of exhaustion, fatigue, burn, pain, afferent feedback, that this is really painful and hurts, that that's the only way for it to be productive. And oftentimes those are the least productive. In fact, more times than not, they are the least productive ways to be training from the fact that they you incur more peripheral damage um, that's harder to recover from. It takes longer times to recover. And then thing is that there's more central fatigue that's incurred during those training sessions which mean as the longer the training session goes on the fewer muscle fibers that you're actually going to activate be able to mechanically load so doing those metabolic style workouts where you're doing a ton of reps and chasing the burn and all that kind of stuff um, that does not drive muscle growth it doesn't mean that you won't experience some results from that but the point is can we get better results from that not beating ourselves into exhaustion. Absolutely, I do it with thousands of people through my groups every day, every week, every month. They get results for the first time. And a lot of times I'll get women come in and they'll have that same sense of trepidation that they had been training six or seven days a week for two hours at a time until they're exhausted. And then within four weeks or five weeks in, they're like, I am hitting weights I had never thought I could hit before because they're finally recovering 
because they're not beating themselves up, up peripherally or from a central fatigue standpoint, and their body is responding the way that it's supposed to. I'm giving it a stimulus. It's going to go, it's basically, there's going to be initially, there's usually a neurological response where there's an improvement in coordination in the lifts. Uh, there's an improvement in rate coding and things like that. So they get stronger initially, and then the muscles start coming on uh, because there's an adaptation that's going to occur after that through contractile proteins. So the what I would tell her is she has to trust that process of locking yourself into a safe movement because chasing something like failure on an RDL is not as appropriate as something like a leg curl, leg extension. Um, you know, you should know if you set the loading appropriately, something, and that's another thing is bringing those reps down into that seven or eight maximum of 12 reps in a set where you're going to failure, where, you know, you simply cannot get another full range rep. And she added on something there. So you also have to define what failure is going to be in that set. So it's failure in a set, usually, typically high level overview where you can't do another full range of motion in that exercise. But if you start doing stuff like partials, clearly there's a lot of force still being generated because you can still move that loading through a certain range of motion. And during that time, there's still going to be your, the muscle fibers that still are able to produce force are going to experience high levels of tension uh, while you're still doing those partials. So it's okay to add stuff in like partials, but just remember from a, just a basic standpoint that even training a rep or two shy of failure is still going to afford you enough reps where the fibers that are activated are going to experience that mechanical loading. So I would tell her what she's going to have to do is just over a long period of time, trust that process of, am I getting stronger? And if she's getting stronger, especially in that six to eight, 10 rep range or whatever, then the program is working. So it's not always just about focusing on making sure I'm getting to failure, but making sure that I'm training in a certain proximity to failure that's in line with my goals, in line with my volume, in line with my frequency, all of those things. But trusting that process over time of, does my performance consistently increasing in the gym? And that's what we use progressive overload to gauge. Is my training productive? Is it working? So that's how I do look at progressive overload is, do I need to have more days between time that I train that particular muscle or do, if I've done that and increase the days between time, do I need to add a little more volume? Do I need to scale it back? But we just use progressive overload to determine are things like where we're training to failure, our proximity to failure, our volume, that kind of stuff. Are those things working the way they're supposed to be working? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest things is, especially that I struggle with myself and and clients is like convincing them to take time to recover and like not training six days a week, um, but using the time that they are training to make sure that they're getting the intensity required to, you know, create that adaptation. Um, so I think there's there's like a line between trying to educate people on like, okay, you need to, you know, work hard enough, right. And, and be in there and, and getting close to failure, maybe not all the way to failure. Um, and then you, you kind of earn the right to, to recover. But if you just go in and kind of lollydag around and then you're just like, all right, like I did my training. So, um, you know, tomorrow's a rest day. I'm going to take it because Paul and Rachel said I needed to rest. Um, so there's like, yeah, a, it's kind of <laughs> like, it's kind of like being sore. It's like uh, we actually know now that soreness is, it, it can be a proxy used to determine what was, what actually did the most amount of work in an exercise or session or whatever. But for the most part, uh, you know, you could go the rest of your life and never get sore again and make all the gains that you're ever going to make. Um, because it's not something that's required. And then muscle damage, uh, is actually a detriment to, in some degrees, to making continued progress. So, and that's another thing that I, I have found a lot of women get hung up on is that they're not like exceedingly sore all the time. That they wonder if they're making progress. I'm like, if you're super sore all the time, um, that's probably not a great thing. Um, I think that it, it, like I said, I early, you know, um, that you could go the rest of your life and never be sore and make progress. However. That's just kind of a scientific level overview. I don't think that's practical in the real world environment. I think that if you never get sore at all, are you even training very hard? Yeah. So I, I think you're going to get sore, but if you're sore to sore all the time, um, there's you're probably either training too often, too much, doing you know uh, too many um, too many sets where you're using longer muscle links and stuff like that. So you would definitely want to reevaluate your training because 
consistently being sore all the time is not a good, um, it's not a good way to measure if your training is being productive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And would you, <clears throat> just a question about soreness. So, um, and I've gotten this before too, and, and wondered myself too, in, in terms of the degree of soreness. Like if I have, say I have my split for the week and I, you know, have on my session, you know, RDLs for, you know, the upcoming day, but I'm still like, I still for sure feel that I'm like, my hamstrings are still, you know, taking it from a few days before. Um, do I still train that movement or like, do you ever like what, under what circumstances is it okay to still train a muscle when it's still, um, in that recovery state? Cause we know that obviously if it's still, um, you know, breaking down and then you go to train it again, like you're, you're kind of doing work, but you're not hitting that adaptation threshold. So does that yeah, question if, make if, sense? A, if a muscle is being, or still being repaired and there's muscle damage from the previous workout, then going in and training it again, doesn't do anything because it's going to go, Oh, I'm, I'm still trying to go get over last time. Like there has to be a process where if you know, muscle damage has happened, that needs to recover. But even if muscle damage has happened, that doesn't like the myth of that has been um, debunked pretty well is the whole, you tear muscle down and then it grows back thicker and bigger and stronger. That's actually not how it works. You can incur muscle damage and more new uh, contractile proteins are not added. And that what's, is what has to happen for hypertrophy to occur is that there has to be more muscle volume in place by the addition of more contractile proteins. So there has to be more myofibrils added to the muscle itself. So if you have a sore muscle, then generally what we kind of think is going on now, because it's funny is that we still, for all these years, we haven't ever definitively link, but what we, we do feel like is happening is that there's an increase um, and calcium uh, release into the stretch mediated ions. So when that happens, the muscles experience that significant degree of soreness. And there is an association there with muscle damage. So until the muscle is recovered from that, there's really not much of a point in training it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, not that if makes sense. To max, not if you're trying to maximize growth. Okay. Well, let me just ask this last question because this is a listener question too. It is a complete shift to nutrition, but maybe we can okay. just end on this one. Um, and we've talked about this, I think, before as well. But someone said, is it really impossible, and I'm sure you get this one all the time, to store excess protein as body fat? Yes. As far as we know, all of the data, and there's four different, there was a metabolic ward study. I don't know why people keep asking me this question when I've answered it. <laughs> Alan Aragon has answered it. I, if you don't know who Alan Aragon is, then you probably don't know very much about any of this stuff because Alan's, you talked about, the king. Alan is the king of nutrition. Um, yeah. He really doesn't have a peer, in my opinion. He's pretty much the best in the industry when it comes to, to nutrition and nutritional approaches. He's also like fame to me, and I feel very honored that he's, he's one of my closest friends, but he really is the best guy in the world when it comes to nutrition. There, I think he said before, and he's actually a very humble guy, but he does know he's really good at what he does. But Alan has made videos himself talking about this phenomenon. Jose Antonio out of the ISSN did four different um, studies that were more like real world applicable studies that looked at really high protein intakes. And I think they were upwards of, they were more than 2.2 uh, grams uh, per pound of body weight. They were like really high. Some of them I think were up to three grams per pound of body weight. Uh, they did multiple studies and in not a single one of them was anybody able to basically accumulate more adipose gain because of the increased protein intake. This was also done in a metabolic ward and they did show that the people who had higher caloric intakes did gain fat. However, the higher protein groups didn't convert any of the actual protein to fat. So the fact is, um, and Alan and I went through like various scenarios to talk about this, is that you would have to be on a pretty, pretty much to convert protein to fat, just remove all the other macros, fats, carbs, and stuff like that. And you would have to have just something like a carnivore diet, but with lean proteins and where you eat so much protein that you would go through gluconeogenesis and then store that as glute, like as, as glycogen and there would be such a spill over there that then it would start storing it as body fat mm -hmm. yeah and that's the, something that the, the, oh, sorry. the chances of that happening yeah. are so exponentially like they just it, they 
it's it would it's almost like uh, it's even be even more rare than getting struck by lightning or dying in a plane crash. It's like just not going to happen. So it is true. And people will I get asked. So people will try to create all sorts of weird scenarios. So like I can see all protein turns right to muscle. I'm like, no, nobody said that because there's muscle can only synthesize at a particular rate. It can no matter how much protein you have coming in. So I'll get really dumb comments from like dumbass dudes that coming in to try to challenge that. And they'll say like, well, so if I, you know, if I just turn directly protein, directly muscle, <laughs> I'm like, I never said that. I just said, it's not going to be stored as adipose tissue. You can only synthesize muscle at a, at a specific rate. I think it's about 10 grams a day. So like the increased protein intake is, has been pr pretty consistent from looking at like in one anecdotal, um, type scenarios competitive bodybuilders have done really high protein intakes during contest prep to retain muscle mass at very high levels for a long time jose antonio did that with all of those studies the same studies where they did very high protein intakes um and nobody gained any in fact all of them ended up leaner and he talked mm -hmm. about that the year review follow-up where he had one that went 12 months and like i said the metabolic ward study which is one of the most highly controlled studies of our time you could ever go research they said right out of the gate that after the study was done that, hey, nobody converted any of the excess protein to body fat. So as of right now, we have, I think, five or six different studies that have looked at very high protein intakes and all of them had the same outcome. And that is, we're, you're just not going to store excess protein as body fat. And then people ask questions like, where does it go? Well, there's whole body protein synthesis that the body uses protein for. There's actually only a very small amount of protein that the body uses. That's why it comes back to the dumb dudes asking me questions like that. The body doesn't use tremendous amounts of protein for muscle protein synthesis. It would be so fantastic if we could just load up on, you know, like just mounds and mounds and just gorge ourselves with protein and all of it just like go right to the tissue. But that doesn't happen. So yeah. no, like adding all that in that protein in, especially like in a mass gaining phase, when you're in a calorie surplus, you can get away with 0.8 grams of protein found body weight. Really the carbohydrates are going to drive a lot of that growth and you still don't need as much of that um, as you think. So when you're in a surplus and you have higher degrees of nitrogen balance and you're going to be more anabolic, but when you're in a deficit, especially where you're like a contest prep person, you're going to need those higher protein intakes along with your training to retain that tissue that you built while you were at the surplus. So no, it doesn't just all of a sudden go to like creating new, you know, new tissue that doesn't happen, but it also doesn't get stored as body fat. So you're going to have some of it go, go like I said, the whole body protein synthesis, you're going to have some go to muscle protein synthesis, you're going to excrete a bunch out and you're going to store um, a bunch of amino acids in the liver. So um, that's pretty much what is going to happen. So yeah. the body, Alan noted this before, and I've done this with clients and even with myself, where he, he puts in um, a protein day. With, it's a very high, what he calls protein hyperfeeding, where he takes protein up to, I want to say it's, I want to say it's more than three grams per pound of body weight. I think that was his. And then in none of his clients, if you see an increase in fat gain, he calls it the disappearing of protein intake. So because you eat it and like we don't store it. Yeah. So there's there's a ton of anecdotal evidence that backs up all of the studies, everything from the peer review to the observational studies that we have. So no, you're really just not going to store proteins body fat. Mm -hmm. That was a very good answer to that question. Okay. <laughs> and a great way to end. <laughs> um, awesome. We, well, have, we, have, we, have time, we have time for one more if you have enough. One more? Okay. Um, Pick your favorite. All right. Here's one more diet related one. And this is, I don't know if we can. You listen. really like the to... diet. You really like the diet related stuff. I know you, you did I'm that. Trying to, I'm trying to balance out because we got, you know, people. Well, the first set of questions training. I got for you too, they were all pretty much all diet related. The last time we talked to you, were, you were really, you were, you were really up on uh, protein spring modified fast mm -hmm. stuff. Yes, yeah, enough. So, yep. Yeah. So, so that, I think that. I think you got a lot of gold nuggets out of the answer I just gave about higher, yeah. higher protein intakes. <laughs> yeah. No, that was a no. That's what I said. It was a really good answer. <laughs> right. um, okay, I do have one more question on here though, because I saw you actually post about this a little while ago. Um, okay. So hopefully we can, I don't know, do it in five minutes. Top reasons you see diets fail. <sighs> Top reasons that I see um, diets fail. If it came back to um, any one particular 
wow, there's so many factors, but anyone can think of a factor. I would say it's that people are not honest with themselves. I would say that it's people are not honest with themselves. Now, here's where I go with that. So uh, somebody will say this diet failed, but then they don't do stuff like they never make a, um, a, a time ever to learn how to count calories and count macros. And that's important. You need to know to, to at least understand what that looks like. There's kind of a big push now to never count calories and macros. And it's really, really effing stupid. Um, you need to spend, in my opinion, if you want to be successful with your dietary approach, you do not have to be overly nuanced or anal retentive, but you do need to spend, in my opinion, a good six months weighing, measuring your food, stuff like that. So you can have an idea of what three, because most people don't know what three ounces of chicken looks like. It is not a lot of food. Most mm -hmm. people don't know what like, see, you know, like a cup of vegetables is. So if you've never spent any time counting macros or weighing your food, then a lot of people will do stuff like uh, they'll say, well, I'm only eating this much or that much or whatever. But if you've ever been hungry and then you go to make your food, you will, if you're honest with, your, with yourself, you will inevitably find that you tend to put more food on your plate. And I know this because I do it and I know uh -huh. what I'm doing. And I'm like, I'm really, really effing hungry. So I'm going to put more food on my plate. Yeah. I think. People will do stuff like um, they will have, um, most people have known, like I have very epic cheat meals, but they don't know how strict I am during the week and how low my calories are during that time. So I can do something like a 6,000 calorie cheat meal on a Friday night, or whatever, and still make incredible progress if people don't know how to do that, but they don't see what I'm doing the other, you know, 23 hours of the day for six or seven days of the week. So... Mm -hmm. I think people are not honest with themselves. They'll have cheat meals. They tend to uh, not count calories. Um, you know, they don't count stuff like alcohol or, you know, there's a multitude of things they don't factor into the equation. So they're not what I would consider to be like incredibly honest um, about their dietary approach. Uh, the other one is, uh, and it comes back to, I don't think people are often, um, they don't have like a self-awareness about the fact that I think dietary approaches have a huge emotional component to them. For example, I could never do flexible dieting if it fits your macro stuff. Um, I can't. I cannot eat a cookie. I don't want to eat a cookie. I don't want to figure out how to fit a cookie into my fucking day. I, if I'm going to eat for the day, I'm going to eat my bro foods. And I actually feel very satisfied at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. If I've just eaten my bro foods, and when I call bro foods, you know, like I've made jokes to people, um, you know, like Lane Norton say stuff over the years, like there's no such thing as clean foods or dirty foods or whatever. But I think what I consistently mean by clean foods is that they're mostly whole food sources. Um, and more often times they're ma very macro dominant, like chicken breast is mostly just protein or jasmine rice is mostly just carbohydrates or whatever. So I tend to consider when I say bro foods, it's like traditional bodybuilding foods, rice, broccoli, chicken you know, lean cuts of red meat, um, you know, fish, oatmeal, stuff like that. It's the, it's typical body, what I call bodybuilding foods. So I feel very good eating that way. I feel very on point. It's very rewarding for me, very rewarding for me. I like being able to crush my diet. And then what I call like for my cheat meals, is like a landmark meal where I go in, I'm like, hey, I really crushed my diet all week. I'm going to have what I want to tonight. That is a very emotionally satisfying approach to me. Now, here's the thing. Well, like when I did a Jordan Sides podcast, Jordan's like, I could never do that. And, then, and, and here's the thing. That is the self-awareness that somebody needs to cultivate to not fail in their diet. To say there's an emotional component to your dieting approach that matters in terms of compliance. So if you, look, if you hate eating a certain way, you're not going to do that very well. I could never do keto. I hate keto. I think keto should die in a kerosene fire. It's the, in my opinion, like for, and now when I say all this, I mean for me. I yeah. can never do a keto diet. The keto dieting sucks ass. I can't stand it. I did keto one time and I did it for like a few weeks. And I was like, I don't have no idea how anybody can do this and enjoy it. I, it felt horrible. My training sucked. I didn't do good with it. And other people, you know, they'll rave about, oh, I finally got a keto and finally I kicked into ketosis and I had the, the ketones surging throughout my bloodstream and I had better mental clarity and energy. But I was the opposite. And the other thing is I had the opposite too. It made me ravenous. Like some people talk about the increased society. I'm like, what are you talking about? I was so ravenous all the time. All I wanted to do was eat like whole cakes, like for dinner every night. Like I couldn't, it was the worst. It was the worst um, feeling as far as like trying to adhere to a diet 
Yeah, and I will talk to other people and be like, oh, I ate, you know, like, like cheeseburgers with like whatever, you know, like bacon and like some cheese, you know, the, like the whole thing that they did. And I'm like, okay, but I can't do that. When I eat like that, I want to eat everything. Mm -hmm. But when I eat my bro diet, I can stick to my diet every day and allow myself, you know, a free meal once or twice a week. And I never deviate. Like I, once I get back on that horse, like I'm just solid for weeks and months on end. But I have a very, that's how I built emotionally to, to, to that approach. So again, I think it's really a kind of combination of those two things, in my opinion, is that they're not honest with themselves about what they're doing with their calories. And the second thing is, is that uh, they aren't picking a dietary approach um, that gives them a sense of emotional calm in some way. Like I said, like uh, Jordan inside and I talked about it, like he can do stuff like a flexible dieting approach where he still has a slice of pizza that would be torture to me it would literally but like being waterboarded i would be like just waterboard me i just i if somebody's like but you can still i like those people who like espouse the flex planning approach like i, I totally get it because there's somebody out there that still wants to be able to have a piece of pizza like a slice of pizza and not feel guilty i don't want a slice of pizza i want four pizzas i'll eat mm -hmm. four pizzas and then i'll have like some cinnamon rolls after that but then people are like, well, you can fit in a bowl of ice cream, whatever. I don't want a bowl of ice cream. I want a gallon of ice cream. <laughs> I, and then I've heard, I've heard other people claim stuff like that's eating. My eating just, I do not have a, it's very fulfilling to me. Uh, people who have eating disorders and I like, that's not my specialty um, are usually doing something like a binge and purge or they're starving themselves or that kind of stuff. My eating approaches consistently lead to a sense of well being, um, achievement. Uh, my body looks better. I feel better. There's, there's literally no drawback. I have a higher degree of compliance with my diet. I feel good. Uh, my performance is good. Um, and I can make minor adjustments um, on depending on what I want to do um, to change those things. So it's a, mm -hmm. it's a very, um, that's the emotional fulfilling part. Yeah. It's, I think you have to understand that, that the emotional relationship that you do have with food and your dietary approach. And it has to be mm -hmm. congruent, in my opinion, with being honest with yourself. It's really weird because as I'm talking about all this, it really sounds just like talking about having a healthy relationship with a person and a healthy relationship in your life. And that's so that kind of comes yeah. back to it's like being honest and, you know, approaching that in a way that is emotionally fulfilling for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. And it's all based off that individual person, too, because like you just said, one thing that is going to work for someone else is going to be absolutely feel like you're water being waterboarded. <laughs> but it might feel the complete opposite for somebody else. Yeah. I have wondered for years how people can do that stuff. Like I can't do it. Like I won't even have it in the house. Like I can't, I've tried before. Like if I eat Oreo cookie, I'm just like, that's it. My, I'm just going to eat this whole package. Yeah. And then I'm like, well, my day's ruined now. So I might as well just <laughs> eat whatever I want. So, and I don't, yeah. I don't do that thing though, where I feel bad. Like some people like I cheated and I feel bad. And I don't ever have guilt. I'm like, all right, well, I'm just going to do it. Because it's, at the end of the day, it's not a huge deal. Now, if you're doing it every day, yeah, you're going to suffer the consequences of that. That's how things in life work. But I don't, I don't tend to do that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, my approach works really well for me. And I've had work with lots of people over the years that that approach works with. I have a great story about that with uh, a girl that I worked with years ago. Um, and she needed to lose about 60 pounds to get down to weight she wanted to get to. And the first approach we tried her on was a, a low-carb approach. And she came, showed, literally showed up at my house. She just lived a block away where we worked together. And she showed up at my house one night. She's like, I can't do this. I'm going insane. I cannot do this. I miss bread. I miss pasta. I miss all these things. I was like, okay. So I flipped her over and gave her a more high, a higher carbohydrate, very low fat approach. And I didn't see her again because she ended up working remotely. And I didn't see her again. It's like eight months later, she showed up at the house one day and she had lost almost all her weight. And it was just wow. a switch from going to low carb to a, a moderate high carb approach and bring her in lower fat. She said she never had a problem from then on. Yeah. So you, I equated calories the same way. She was eating the same amount of calories in both things, but one way worked for her, one, one way didn't. The keto zealots would tell you that that high carb approach that I gave her would never allow her to lose fat. Yeah. And I mean, like that is, I've seen the opposite as well in terms of like flipping that too. Like someone's used to high carb and they go low carb and like, oh, I can finally see results, but it's all coming back to that individual. And then also taking into account what you just said about the, you know, what works with my lifestyle and my emotional um, lifestyle as well. So I think it's, 
you know, everybody's their own individual and, you know, you just kind of, I mean, right. I go to the, dinner. Like I can go, I can go to dinner. I can do stuff like go to dinner and stay on my diet and I feel fine. Mm -hmm. But if I go to dinner and I want to get off my diet, then I'm going to really treat yeah. myself. So yeah. um, those approaches work for a lot of people. Um, I, like I said, I, the one thing I don't do is condemn approaches. There was a, I wrote an article for T nation years ago talking about the, the German doctor that actually he had people on a sugar. It was a sugar, basically literally table sugar, table sugar was part of the diet. But he restricted their calories with like mm -hmm. table sugar. It was like table sugar, bread. I can't remember what it was. Just all, it was an all carbohydrate diet. It was like really obese people and they all lost a crap ton of weight. And they were literally eating table sugar as part of their diet. Yeah. <laughs> now that like people would say, I don't again, I don't agree that that's the approach you, you should take. But yes, at the end of the day, um, as long as you're in your calorie deficit with your adequate protein intake mm -hmm. to retain muscle, um, that's what it's going to take. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, do you want to just tell our viewers or listeners where they can find you, um, social media, your website, all that jazz? Yeah. Well, my website, I don't do anything with it anymore. It's just up there. Oh. And it's all, all my old blog articles. I actually need to do a real website this year. Um, I pro should probably do that. Um, <laughs> if you, yeah, I'm still lift run bang on social media, depending on if my account has been taken down or not. Um, has we'll happened. link all five of them in the show notes. I, I got the, I lost four in one week. Um, but I managed to get this one back. I think I'll be okay this time. Um, okay. so I, I managed to actually make contact with somebody at Instagram. So I, I think I'll be okay. I've lost two, two, a hundred K accounts. Um, so, crazy. so that's, yeah, I know it's, it's pretty depressing. Cause I could have had like two or 300 K uh, account by now. So, um, but I'm, I'm coming back, I'm coming back. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you, if you search for Paul Carter, generally, I think I come up now, I have also been on shadow band. I was shadow band for a while. Um, mm -hmm. so, but you can find me on Twitter, lift run bang, uh, Instagram, lift run bang, um, on Facebook, same thing. Um, if you just pretty much search that anywhere, you're going to find me somewhere. Sounds good. And I'll make sure to link all of those in the show notes. So and I'll make sure to, uh, to promote it for you. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, it was great catching up with you again and yep. maybe we'll do this again another time <laughs> yes i have a i have to get ready this week with everything's jam-packed because i i uh, i got a house down in florida and oh uh, nice we're in florida yeah yeah i'm gonna be down in southwest florida um okay. and so i it's it the weather is great down there um, awesome and it's uh that's one of the things i have a place in kansas city um and i have a place in, in southwest florida now so during the winter months i'll be able to get away from this horrible Midwest winter weather <laughs> and get down there and still be warm. And then, uh, and then the other thing is like, my girls are really excited about, um, about coming down during like spring breaks and summers mm -hmm. and stuff and doing a lot of fun stuff. So I'm excited about that too. So uh, it's been a nice awesome. new season in my life to actually go ahead. I've been wanting to get out of Kansas city for like five years and I like Kansas city just fine, but I hate the winters here. The Midwest, mm -hmm. Midwest winters are horrible. You're in Cali, right? Yeah. I'm in San Diego. Yeah, well, it's, you don't even, you yeah. don't know not about, you get wake up. <laughs> but I, I grew up in New York, so I know a I little bit about the winters. <laughs> yeah, okay, so if you were in, like, yeah, yeah Jordan Syed and I were talking about this, and Jordan is from Boston, he, he's, he has to say he has PTSD about winter weather, he's down in Dallas now, and he has PTSD about winter weather, about the overcast days, and the cold, and wind, uh -huh. and all that kind of stuff, it's a real thing, so I'm very excited and happy about it. the only thing, like I said, I have a 19-hour drive this weekend, um just yeah. because i've been renting cars for the last few months looking for a house down there um and that's a lot of wasted money in my car so i'm just taking my car and driving down for the next like this weekend for 19 hours which will suck but yeah. it'll be one and done and over with so pretty yeah happy. yeah find a good podcast or something you like i i know when i moved from grad school in virginia i had to drive back down to miami because that's where i went to undergrad in miami um but i i put on the podcast I don't even remember the name of it anymore. It was like uh, the cer cereal. That was the name of it. This was like right. a while ago. And I literally listened to the entire thing on my, I think it was like a 13 or 14 hour drive. And it just flew by. Like, I don't even remember it. So that's such a great idea. I'll find, yeah. I'll find me a podcast. Got a million episodes and chunking on. Yeah, just, just go at it. Just go at it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, good luck with the trip. And I'm excited for you to be in Florida. I miss, I miss it down there um you're gonna have a lot of fun it's, well, yeah that's great. i hope so that's that's the key that's the goal all right thanks for having me on rach i appreciate you all right talk to you soon thanks so much for tuning in to another episode of metflex and chill i hope you enjoyed it 
It would be awesome if you could give the show five stars and leave a review on iTunes. We're trying to get placed in the top 100 health podcasts and the five star ratings and reviews are what can help make that happen. I'll add step-by-step -step directions for leaving a review in the show notes. I know it's a big ask, but it really helps. Thanks again. See you next time.